Good morning, everyone. While my PowerPoint is being set up, let me just say thanks to Rob and Sherry for focusing on the Arctic at their policy conference this week. And thank you for the opportunity to sort of set the stage for the day. Uh, that is what a keynote is supposed to do. And I will do my best. I, I think I can sum up my remarks and much of the day with a single word, and that is change. Change is the order of the day in the Arctic, and certainly uh, you're experiencing a little bit of that here as well. Thank you for leaving a little <laughs> of um, I, I might be able to actually find my cursor. Okay, there we go. And you might not fall asleep, so this is, this is a very good thing. Uh, this is the theme for the chairmanship of the Arctic Council. So I, I want you to kind of absorb that for just a moment. Shared challenges, opportunities, and responsibilities, one Arctic. Um, so uh, pretty much everything I'm going to say in the next 20 minutes or so is on this slide. Uh, I'm going to cover a bit about the national and international and local and regional interests in the Arctic. I'm going to talk about some of the challenges, opportunities, and responsibilities. And I'm going to do just a little bit of stage setting at the beginning on the topic of the Arctic itself. Why am I doing that? I realize that in this room there are many Arctic experts. But I'm going to guess there may be just a few people in this room for whom this is kind of new space. And I realize that um, you know we like to take for granted that everybody knows what we know. But let's start with the basics just for a moment. Um, Antarctica is landmass surrounded by water. The Arctic is the Arctic Ocean, water surrounded by land. This is not a small difference. This is a major difference. This cryosphere is surrounded by eight Arctic nations, five actually with coastlines on the Arctic Ocean, that have very specific ideas about how their Arctic should be used and managed and what is happening there because four million people live in this space surrounding the Arctic Ocean. And so just in terms of geopolitics, in terms of understanding the environments and the sort of the international space that we're talking about, it is quite different. Now, when scientists look at the Arctic, this is sort of what they see. When people in the United States look at the Arctic, this is what they think of. <laughs> they think of Alaska as a small island off the coast of either California or Texas. <laughs> and it, it really, it, it leads to a lot of very strange ideas about what the Alaska thing is all about. And of course, the, the recent uh, run of reality television shows hasn't really helped um, <laughs> Americans understand Alaska either, or understand some of the challenges that are, we face in the Arctic. So those of us who do spend time talking about Alaska, about the Arctic, are always kind of overcoming some misperceptions about what it really is all about. And one of the things that really frustrates Alaskans is that people are shocked when they see Alaska in scale. And this is the scale. Uh, Alaska is two and a half times the size of Texas. We have 750,000 people, so kind of the city of Memphis stretched out over one-fifth the size of the United States. So again, just for those of you who aren't terribly familiar with what, what we talk about with the US Arctic, um, Alaska is a very large, diverse, interesting, culturally rich, and now somewhat stressed place because of the price of oil, because of course we're an oil state. Um, and, and that is the, our setting. But remember, the people who live in Alaska feel very strongly that they should have a voice in Arctic policy, whether it's at the national level or at the international level. So uh, that's that's sort of my introduction. I could go into a lot more about Alaska and about the Arctic. But what's really interesting to me as a long-time Alaskan is how much more attention is being played to the Arctic than used to be the case. Um, so uh, on the cover of popular magazines, on television shows, increasingly, there is a focus on what's going on in the Arctic. You know, the ice is melting, um, oil and gas development might be happening there, perhaps there's a new shipping route. Uh, there's a lot now of uh, what I would describe as sort of superficial, but yet kind of intriguing information about the Arctic, which is beginning to shift 
the United States' attention into paying a little more attention to this space. Indeed, last week on the front page of the Washington Post, there's Secretary Sally Jewell in Kivalina seeing with her own eyes the challenges being faced in a number of Alaska communities that are experiencing rapid coastal erosion as a result of winter storms and thawing permafrost and a variety of factors that really are hitting hard the coastal communities, particularly in northern and western Alaska. This also is adding more to this sort of, uh, I guess, popular culture curiosity about a space that for a long time was just sort of out of sight, out of mind. Uh, again, as an Alaskan, this is great because with a little bit of curiosity comes the opportunity for a teachable moment, for the opportunity for science and, and for those who do know a lot about the Arctic, and I know there are many of you in this room, to really provide information in a much more coherent way about what difference does it make that Arctic ice is retreating as fast as it is? How does it affect weather patterns worldwide? What does it mean, not just for the people who live in the region, but for the entire world. So the, the teeing up of these questions and this curiosity, uh, which we will now be hearing from for the rest of the day, some superb scientists who are puzzling through the connected tissue, so to speak, between what is happening in the Arctic and what is happening around the world. The Why the Arctic Matters brochure that you see on here is the first of a series that the Arctic Research Commission is doing to try to tease out this curiosity even more among people to learn a bit more about what is changing in the Arctic. Perhaps the most dramatic change, really, if you, if you just look at measurements, of course, the ice, the 50% less in extent and 75% less in total volume of Arctic sea ice. But it's not only sea ice. It's warming temperatures and perming, uh, thawing permafrost. It's a lot of increased human activity, some of which is possible because of that increased access, and some of which is sort of you know, um, speculative as a possibility out there in the future. Change is the order of the day. It's also changing economics. It's not only about ice and warming. It's also about globalization. It's about population increase in India and China and the middle class wanting energy and the demand for oil and gas. And for all of these reasons, much more attention is being paid, including the shipping industry that is speculating on shorter routes through the northern sea route above Russia or the Northwest Arctic Passage. Uh, across Canada, and the concern, of course, by the defense community that perhaps standing up additional resources to be able to respond to a disaster, but also because of national security interests, all of these things combine to create this growing sense of there's something going on in the Arctic, we need to pay attention to it, what are we doing about it, how do we plan for it, and how do we prepare for it. Um, the, the shipping activity, yes, it is on the increase, but it's still very small if you look at total volume. It's, it's teeny in comparison to many other places. But having said that, uh, for a space that has had relatively <coughs> little shipping activity, except sort of regional supply shipping, it's something that we take note of. But perhaps really the elephant in the room here is oil and gas. When USGS came out with its estimate a few years ago that of the world's remaining undiscovered fossil fuel, 13% is in the Arctic for oil and 30% of natural gas is in the Arctic, it really captured a lot of attention. And of course, that attention is playing out in many places in the Arctic, in, in Norway and Greenland and Canada and the United States, where there has been the opportunity for leasing, exploration, for uh, discovery, potential discoveries, and unquestionably the current low price of oil is having a chilling effect on the, that potential because this region is a very expensive area to do exploration or development. But having said that, where there is oil, there is opportunity, and uh, that isn't going to go away. 
What is of concern to many people, of course, is how to do that development safely in a way that is responsible with regard to the environment, the animals, the humans that call the Arctic home. And there has been an, a stepping up in the attention being paid to not only preparing for possible development, but preparing for a disaster, which we hope would never ever happen, but that could happen. So the National Research Council's work and the report that they produced last summer, looking at the question of how would you respond to an oil spill in icy waters is a very timely piece of work. I think one other thing that gets speculated a lot about is fishing in the Arctic and the potential that warming and, and changing ecosystems might create additional opportunity. It's important to say that there is already vibrant fisheries in the Arctic or near Arctic in some portions of the Arctic. Uh, if you look at Norway, if you look at the Bering Sea, um, there are places where the fishing today is vibrant. There are many places where we simply do not know enough about the resource to responsibly be able to manage a fishery, which is why the United States of America put a moratorium on fishing uh, three years ago above the Bering Strait. So there's a lot of, you know, again, speculation about and the potential for science being able to inform us in not only understanding what's there, but might might be a reasonable and responsible management practice. But increasingly what the concern is, at least in Alaska and in the Pacific Northwest, and if you go to many Arctic conferences, you will hear this concern expressed frequently, and that is the extent to which the ocean's increasing absorption of CO2 is leading to increased acidification of the ocean in some pretty dramatic ways. And of course, in cold water, more CO2 is absorbed, and so the acidification issue becomes even more relevant and somewhat scary in the North. Uh, this is a recent piece of research that basically tried to tease out which regions of Alaska's coast might be significantly impacted in a way that would hurt existing fisheries. So that sort of sets the stage for the rate of change, the way in which change, both economic and climate, uh, are teasing up big questions. I'd now like to shift my remarks to covering what is the United States doing about this emerging area and what needs to be done in terms of preparing the nation to cope with the challenges and opportunities of the Arctic. So I'm going to talk a bit about the national picture, and then I'm going to talk about the international picture. So the national picture. Uh, as Sherry mentioned, the national strategy for the Arctic region was adopted. And in that strategy, there are three sort of principal pillars advancing U.S. security interests, pursuing responsible stewardship, and strengthening international cooperation. I might just note that all of the Arctic eight have national strategies. Every single one of the Arctic nations has adopted something very similar to this. And it's really interesting if you read all of the strategies from Russia, from Canada, from Norway, from Finland, you'll see these themes echoed with slight variations but that's pretty much it. And these themes play out in a variety of ways, of course, through the very various federal agencies, which is why it was really a wonderful thing that the Obama administration stepped up and looked at some of the individual strategies that departments had been developing. NOAA had an Arctic strategy. The Coast Guard had an Arctic strategy. The Navy had an Arctic strategy. But when the national Arctic strategy came along, it kind of was this um, umbrella that embraced those pieces and that also challenged those agencies that hadn't yet developed their own agency national or agency strategy to step up to the plate. So yes, the law that created the Arctic Research Commission and the, uh, back in 1984, sort of, that was an early days, I would say, in terms of the U.S. government thinking about the Arctic as a place that really needed to be 
researched and planned for. But it's been in the last few years that we have seen all of these decisions and strategies and implementation plans. <laughs> so the strategy in 2013, the implementation plan in 2014, the executive order in 2015, the first meeting of the steering committee that was created by the executive order last month, we have seen in recent years a tremendous step up in activity and focus by the federal government, which is, I would say, long overdue, but better late than never. It is perhaps triggered because of the fact that there's this growing realization that this space is challenging and yet requires us to work together as a nation with local, state, regional people, as well as international people, if we're going to be responsible stewards. Um, I, I think that this illustrates that there is still a lot more work to be done, but that progress has been made. Now, more specifically, as it relates to research and to science, how is that integrated into what the federal agencies are doing? Uh, to understand that, a very important piece of it is IARPIC, the Interagency Arctic Research Policy Committee, which was created by the same law that created the Arctic Research Commission back in 1984. And that IARPIC entity, which really is a reflection of all of the federal agencies that have some federal Arctic research capacity or funding, they developed a couple of years ago a five-year research plan, which really lays out what federal agencies need and plan to do to support their decision-making in their statutory responsibilities and obligations. And it, it was, a, again, a huge step forward in comparison to previous years. It's not everything that the federal government is doing or needs to do, but it is a way of bringing the federal agencies together to focus on where there is this opportunity to help each other. And they have put in motion implementation plans and committees that actually take it to the next level. So this is basically the process that is laid out in the law that passed in 1984. The Arctic Research Commission sets broad goals. IARPIC takes it to the next level in terms of a research plan. And then under ideal conditions, uh, Congress adopts a budget that reflects the priorities uh, that are identified by OSTP and by OMB that reflect this work that has been done. Uh, we all know that we live in the real world, not exactly the ideal world, but this helps people sort of have a framework for how the system can work and in some instances does work. Um, there's also supposed to be an, a, a, another step which is sort of an evaluation of how that money is being spent, but I would have to admit that that has not really reached its full potential. Um, in the next month or so, we are going to be releasing our newest version of our goals and objectives uh, that sort of is part of this important process. These are the six research themes that are identified by the commission as being the significant ones to focus on at both the federal government level, but also to the extent that it helps inform universities and NGOs and other policy people who are thinking about Arctic research. This is a way of organizing I guess, in, in a way, the six themes that we think are very important to focus on. Okay, so that briefly covers the national scene, and, and only superficially, of course, because of time constraints. Let's switch gears to international interests. There are many entities out there, and we don't have time to go through them all, but uh, that have a voice in, and interest in, and commitment to, and do work in the Arctic. Um, the IMO, for example, which has just been working for years on a mandatory polar code. There are many examples like that. I'm just going to take a moment to focus on the Arctic Council. Because the Arctic Council, which was created in 1996, has been the principal entity for coordination and effective communication among the Arctic nations ever since 1996. It is important to say what it is and what it isn't. It is not a treaty-based organization. It does not issue orders, make decisions, um, regulate things. It does not give away money. It is a forum for conversation and discussion 
and the opportunity for the eight Arctic nations, the six permanent participants, and the observers to work together on two principal themes. And those two themes have been the same since day one, protecting the environment of the Arctic and promoting sustainable development of the Arctic. Those have been the foundation from the beginning, and they still are. And so there's a whole lot that the Arctic Council does not focus on, but it continues to focus and do good work on all of those. I might just note, and you probably all know this, but the member states are Canada, Greenland, Finland, Iceland, Norway, Russia, Sweden, and the United States. The permanent participants are in the indigenous people of the North. The groups are the Aleut International Association, the Arctic Athabascan Council, the Gwich'in Council International, the Inuit Circumpolar Council, the Russian Association of Indigenous Peoples of the North, and the Sami Council. And unlike many organizations, the permanent participants play an active role in the Arctic Council process. And although it is still one of those things where I would have to say it's not perfect because there's a lot of evolution that is going on, it, it does provide a much more meaningful way of taking into consideration the people who live in this region than I would say many other organizations do. Very briefly, this is the structure of the council. Um, there's no point in going through the details except to say that at the ministerial level, that's the Secretary John Kerry level, they meet at the beginning and the end of a chairmanship. The senior Arctic officials, which is usually at the State Department level, Julie Gorley is our senior Arctic official and has been for years, they meet twice a year. The working groups meet very frequently focused on specific projects. That's kind of where the work of the Arctic Council really gets done. And over the years, those working groups have produced a rich array of assessments and technical reports and recommendations on everything from the safe operation of oil and gas, guidelines for oil and gas operations in the North, to a recent assessment on ocean acidification in the Arctic Ocean. So this a wide variety of work there. I mention this because if you are looking for source material, information that could be useful to you, I really recommend that you go to the Arctic Council website because you'll find a lot of very useful information there. The Arctic Council has changed in the last 20 years. And so as the US chairmanship rolls around, I just want to take note of something that is quite a bit different than it was the last time the US chaired it. And that is that in recent years, there has been much more a stepping up toward trying to bring closer alignment among the Arctic eight, particularly on issues where they feel as though if they reached some agreement, that they would be able to take it to the next level of effectiveness. So in recent years, two agreements have been initiated by the Arctic Council, one on search and rescue and one on responding to oil spills in the Arctic Ocean. Now, again, I mentioned that it's not a treaty organization, so the Arctic Council itself does not adopt these. They, they have recommended them, they've agreed to them, and then they go back to the nations for adoption. That's the way the Arctic Council <coughs> works. And a third one is being negotiated even as we speak. It relates to international cooperation on scientific research. So it is certainly relevant to our day's work. Um, and uh, you could, we may talk more about that later, but it, it comes out of a desire to take to the next level the kind of observing system networks that have been in existence in the past and to deal with some of the difficulties. I just have one slide here that shows the difference between the U.S. request to conduct marine scientific research in the Russian EEZ um, back 20 years ago versus now. Um, it, it, these are things that are not the reason to do it, but they all contribute to a concern that at this time we want more cooperation, not uh, less cooperation, in terms of this important Arctic Ocean research effort being made by all of the countries. So let's talk briefly about the U.S. chairmanship. The U.S. chairmanship begins next month. So next month, uh, the U.S. will chair the Arctic Council for a two-year period of time. 
The pattern that has been in existence from the beginning is that when a country chairs the Arctic Council, it sets out a two-year agenda. Remember, this is based on these two fundamental principles of why the Arctic Council came together in the first place. That is, protection of the environment and sustainable development. So it's within that context. But here are the three themes for the U.S. chairmanship. Arctic Ocean safety, security, and stewardship, improving the economic and living conditions of the people of the Arctic, and addressing the impacts of climate change. These are probably not surprising. They're not very different, frankly, than a lot of work that has already been done by the Arctic Council. But under each of these three themes, there are very specific projects. And even as we speak here today, um, the State Department team is in Canada negotiating with the other Arctic nations, senior Arctic officials, about the specifics of these projects. So the U.S. put out some projects under all three of these themes. I got reactions from them. They're right now they're negotiating who's going to do what, which of these projects might other countries want to lend some resources to, and which ones, frankly, are they not very enthusiastic about at all. That's what's happening right now at the senior Arctic official level. So I can't talk very specifically about the projects because they're kind of changing, but um, they they are evolving in a way that I think covers interests that are very similar, whether it's at the local, regional, state, national, or international level. Uh, Secretary Kerry has also said that he has a goal of strengthening the Arctic Council the governance within the council to make it as streamlined, effective, and efficient as possible, and make sure that the work that is done by the Arctic Council is actually utilized in a way that is meaningful. And he has also been identified an important priority of the U.S. chairmanship, which is uh, public diplomacy. And I guess what that is code for is helping Americans understand what the Arctic's all about, and why climate change is really important, and why the people of the Arctic are facing significant challenges, as well as why there are opportunities in the North that Americans ought to care about. America is really the only one of the Arctic eight that doesn't self-identify as an Arctic nation. If you're in Canada, they think they are an Arctic nation. If you're in Russia, it's, it's a lot about the Arctic. I'll tell you, if you're in Finland, Norway, or Sweden, they talk about snow how. Not know how, but snow how. I mean, they think Arctic. America, not so much. Back to Alaska being an island off the coast of Texas or California. So I think part of this public diplomacy strategy goal is really to help elevate the understanding of the American people of Alaska, the Arctic, and why it matters to them. And I think it's a great goal, and I hope many people in this room will help uh, achieve uh, some progress on that. Both Secretary Kerry and his predecessor, Secretary Clinton, have taken a much more active interest in the Arctic Council than any of the previous Secretaries of State. Matter of fact, Secretary Clinton was the first to actually attend Arctic Council meetings. And since then, both she and Secretary Kerry have taken the Arctic portfolio much more seriously, and again, uh, in terms of how this space is emerging as a place that is recognized as an important region of the world where there is a lot of action and where there is a lot of need for attention, preparation, planning, research, science, and improvement of information. So I I'm going to spend just a moment on this aspect. I could spend a whole hour talking about what we really should talk about, which is what's happening at the local, regional, state levels, not only in Alaska, but in other places. Again, I want to return to my theme that people live in the Arctic. They call it home. They have for thousands of years. And so what happens there is extremely important. It's up close and personal. So there are many entities within Alaska and many entities throughout the North that are very focused on what's happening in their neighborhood, whether it's regional subsistence councils or marine mammal commissions, whether in the case of Alaska, it's the recent report which was done by the Alaska Arctic Policy Commission, 
which sets out a policy for the state of Alaska vis-a-vis -vis the Arctic. And I know that seems strange that that's just happening now, but even Alaska has kind of taken for granted, well, do we really need a policy? Uh, yes, and, and they are moving that forward as well as what is happening at the national and international level. If you are interested in sort of the Alaska view, the Alaska perspective on that, uh, you can go to the Alaska Arctic Policy Commission report. They submitted a number of pieces of legislation to the Alaska legislature, uh, and this, they're currently in session, so I'm not sure which of those things may pass, but there is a lot going on. I, what I'm trying to say, there's a lot going on on all levels. So what ties it together? What's sort of the wrap-up here? The wrap-up is that there are a lot of shared interests, shared concerns, shared opportunities, shared responsibilities, back to the US chairmanship theme of one Arctic, but shared opportunities, challenges, and responsibilities. What are those shared ingredients? I'd say there is a shared interest in community resilience. And that is the communities of the people, the people of the Arctic, in a wide variety of ways, their language and culture, their food security, the sense of the importance of paying attention to human health and how climate change is changing human health as well as animal health. And the challenges associated with how coastal erosion, thawing permafrost, and all of the conditions that are changing in the Arctic are really impacting the infrastructure of communities. There's a shared interest in safety. Safety of the environment, safety of human beings, safety of our infrastructure, safety that may come from additional development that we can't even see right now, whether that's shipping or oil and gas or mining or whatever it may be. And the joint shared responsibility at the local, state, regional, in national and international level to put in place systems that will help deal with that concern for safety. There's the shared interest in the climate, the changing climate and the implications of the changing climate in so many ways, both locally and globally. And the way in which those changes, whether it's sea ice changes or thawing permafrost, impact humans, impact the environment, and change the systems completely, which you'll hear more about during the day. And there's a shared interest in research. Knowledge and understanding gained through research is absolutely essential at all levels of the decision-making process, whether it's the public sector or the private sector, whether it's federal agencies trying to make decisions about permits or Congress trying to make decisions about legislation or business trying to make decisions about where, when, and how to develop or individuals making decisions about whether it's safe to go out on the ice to hunt or to fish or to drive their truck for a whole host of reasons. The interest in research, in observation and data, in cooperation and coordinating the research effort and then synthesizing the pieces of information that comes from that research into a cohesive whole so that people can make better choices. In closing, this is my commercial. Um, the U.S. Arctic Research Commission is an entity that, in addition to the goals report that I mentioned earlier, in addition to workshops that we host and co-host and reports that we write on specific topics, every day we publish a daily update that electronically keeps you in touch with what's happening in the Arctic. For those of you who have not yet signed up and who are actually interested, just go to our website, arctic.gov. And you can sign up for this electronic newsletter, which will tell you about the most interesting recent science, about the public policy statements being made by elected officials, by upcoming meetings, and there are lots of them every day, everywhere, about the Arctic. I encourage you to take a look at this as a tool that you might be able to use to keep you informed about the Arctic. Uh, in closing, I would just like to take a moment to introduce the, my fellow commissioners who are here today. Um, and maybe you could just stand as, as I read your name. Uh, Jim McCarthy, Charlie Borismati, Warren Zapol, Mary Pete, Edward Itta, David Benton, um, 
we, we work together as a team, and I also want to acknowledge both John Farrell and Cheryl Rosa, our staff, and say thanks to all of them for the good work that they do. So in closing, and I think I've just run out of time, um, let me say that the Arctic is an exciting place. It's a challenging place. It's an opportunity space. It is a place where there is a great deal of misunderstanding and confusion to which I have to ask you, as people who care about the Arctic and care about this very special ecosystem, to help be ambassadors for the Arctic. Help be people who can inform others about not only what it is, why it's important, why it's relevant to their lives, but also why it is incredibly important that as a nation, we stand up the necessary resources to be good stewards of this place. That's everything from supporting scientific research to building icebreakers to providing a policy framework that allows the agencies that have important responsibilities in the Arctic to make good choices about balancing the very many demands on this emerging area. So I ask you to take what you know about the Arctic and share it and help other people become a little better educated about why the Arctic matters and why it is important to support those who are trying to understand it and those who can make that information available to others so that we make good choices and remain good stewards of the Arctic. Thank you very much.